let me jump right in. We are experiencing extraordinary levels of inequality in the United States, instability, change, turmoil, and now on top of it, the Trump administration's imposition of an extreme right-wing agenda. Do you believe, and you, I know you travel a lot, you talk to a lot of people, are we approaching a kind of tipping point, crisis point? Do you have a sense of, a, of an impending explosion or implosion as the, as the end game of all of this? Yeah, but Trump is not the, uh, the genesis of our problem. Uh, we live in a system that Sheldon Wilson calls inverted totalitarianism, and this is spelled out in his last book, Democracy Incorporated, and it, it's this sense of, you know, the corporate coup d'etat, that it's not traditional totalitarianism where you overthrow a system and replace its iconography and language, and re it revolves around a charismatic leader, but it's through the power of the anonymity of the corporate state, it's where economics takes precedence over politics. Fascism, for instance, politics would take precedence over economics. And so the facade is like the late Roman Republic. The facade remains. I mean, the Senate under Augustus is still, in theory, operating. The Senate operates under Nero, Caligula, Commodius, all of the late Commodius kind of reminds me of Trump. And so Trump is the product of a failed democracy. Trump is the product of a system that has been seized by a tiny corporate cabal and administered by mandarins or courtiers in the Republican and Democratic Party. So, so Trump is the symptom, not the disease. He's what dysfunctional societies always cough up. And I covered the war in the Yugoslavia, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, and you saw in the late 1980s the economic collapse of Yugoslavia, in part fueled, of course, by the international banking that wouldn't allow them to restructure their loans. Tito had taken out massive loans that everyone knew he could never repay, but he was useful as a buffer state. So you had hyperinflation, huge factory closures, and in essence, deindustrialization, and you uh, vomited up these figures like uh, Slobodan Milosevic or Franu Tuzman or others. And that's, that's where we are. So uh, Trump is extremely dangerous, not because he has any ideology, he has none. But within that ideological vacuum, you are watching the Christian fascists, the Christian right, essentially fill or, 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 or create an ideological symptom, a uh, system that, that Trump is very willingly serving. And they have a base. They have uh, you know, Liberty University and uh, TBN, and, and, and I really, and I speak as a seminary graduate and now an ordained Presbyterian minister. I look, I didn't use the word, I wrote a book called American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War in America. I didn't use the term fascist lightly. They are heretical, they are Christian heretics. They did what the German Christian Church did under the Nazis, which is fuse the iconography and language of Christianity with the iconography and language of the state, or in the case of the Nazi party. So what we are waiting for, and what we're going to get, people like you speak about it, is uh, at some point another financial meltdown. This time around, they don't have plan B, because you can't, they can't lower interest rates anymore. They're already at zero. I mean, we had a case in Europe where they're actually negative. They would pay you to borrow money. So. And at that point, I mean, the, these societies that devolve into these monstrosities, as we saw in Yugoslavia or as we saw in Weimar, they need a crisis of that magnitude. And then what I worry is that we, we bring up, a, that's when the political freaks really come out. And we begin to see empowered people who are even more dangerous and less clueless and less benign. I mean, Trump will look sagacious, you know, kind of wise by comparison. And, and, and this is why Noam Chomsky, I think, correctly says, don't be careful of wishing for the uh, impeachment of Trump because Pence is worse and he's right. And, and I would argue that, you know, Wall Street, they find Trump an embarrassment. How can you not find him an embarrassment? And yet he did do what the fascists did, both in Italy and Germany, is they went straight to the centers of power and said, what do you want? And what they wanted was destruction of Dodd-Frank, not that it's particularly useful, massive uh, tax cuts, which they got, 
and deregulation of everything. Um, the fossil fuel industry, the financial industry, and that's what Trump gave them. And then the military. He gave them a 10% budget increase, even though they never asked for it. And he gave them carte blanche to run our overseas military projects. And that's, you know, you look back, I don't want to call Trump Hitler, because he's not, they're very different. But Hitler did the same. I mean, you know, the, the, the Wehrmacht couldn't stand the brown shirts. And so he got rid of the brown shirts. Krupp, I.B. Farman, very uneasy with the Nazis. But I think that power now, Trump doesn't come from a party the way the Nazi party or the way the, the, the black shirts were in Italy. So it is different. Power really does rest now completely in the hands of corporate America. And so the proper term is probably Shell and Will is inverted totalitarianism, but it's a, I would argue, a species of fascism. And I, I talked to Wollen before he died, and Wollen said that the great kind of the way you buy off the populace is through a cheap consumer products produced in sweatshops overseas and access to easy credit. Well, that access to easy credit is gone, probably because of the huge, the trillions in bailouts. The money does have to be paid back, even though it's 0% interest. And of course, they do it by uh, forcing us into debt peonage. So your credit card is late. Next thing you know, you're paying 28% uh, on it. Um, it's all the medical costs, uh, you know, all the ways they have to extract money from us. So the danger, I think, that we face comes when that debt bubble implodes. Student debt is what over a trillion, and eventually it implodes. Yes. And, and then the rage, and the rage is already powerful. And I, and I should throw in that, you know, we're watching the Democratic Party commit political suicide by refusing to address the issues that, that gave rise to Trump and, and the insurgency of Bernie Sanders. And so the, the Democrats are worrying about messaging instead of worrying about social inequality, chronic unemployment and underemployment, student debt, a collapsing corporate-run healthcare system, which no one can afford. They won't address any of them. You know, raising the wage, which wages since the 70s have declined or remained stagnant. They won't address any of those issues, and that's because they are an appendage of the corporate state. Figures like Schumer, Pelosi, Perez, Obama, the Clintons, they wouldn't exist without this money and an elite party structure within the Democratic Party that is deeply anti-democratic. I mean, people are kind of brought out as props at the convention, which is just choreographed, you know, Disneyland-like. It has no a actual resemblance to a political convention. And I would argue the Democratic Party is not a real political party. So we are set, we are standing on the precipice. And the inability on the part of the left, once again, we're watching the left, put their faith in the Democratic Party. I mean, how many decades of betrayal do they need? I mean, to figure out who these people are. So, yeah, I'm very, I'm very worried. It is, it is annoying. And, I mean, it's spoken about climate change, which we're all doesn't exist. So, I'm very What role in all of this is played by the media in the United States? Is there any manipulation of the fake news phraseology fit into all of this? Well, the, Trump and the commercial media are in a symbiotic relationship. The entities like CNN or MSNBC, they're making more profits than they've ever made in the Trump reality television show. The fact that he is unpredictable, the fact that he is vulgar, he is paying off porn stars, and they love it. And so they function as uh, courtiers in Versailles, uh, gossiping about the proclivities and habits of the monarch. Let's take Louis XIV because he was worse than Louis XVI, you know, with all of his mistresses. And, uh, and that's what they do. And, but you have a majority of this country that is suffering in real pain. And, and I would argue being oppressed by the very institutions that Trump attacks. So the inability on the part of the Democratic Party to respond, I would argue, rationally to what's happening, and the kind of cruel, 
tweets and taunts and insults that Trump spews forth through his Twitter account or when he's interviewed, it does play to a people who, one, have been betrayed, who are still being betrayed, and who hate this system. And, and they have every reason to hate this system. And the failure on the part of progressives or the left to run a counter narrative, and I would argue that's what happened after the 1929 crash in Weimar, because everyone forgets, although the social democrats were in power, what did they do? They imposed austerity. They stopped paying unemployment insurance. The Nazis were pulling in single digits in 1928. By 1930, they had, what, a third? Yeah, a third of the Reichstag. Pushing to the half yeah. in the popular vote. And then they had the communists and the social democrats who couldn't make a coalition. So, you know, history wasn't, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, I can't remember who said that. But it does, and, and, and uh, Yugoslavia would be another example. So we live in a system of political paralysis whereby all institutions, uh, government and power, are, are directed towards enriching that corporate cabal, which means that they are not responding at all to even the most basic needs and rights of the citizenry. And that is just unsustainable. And when we hit a moment of crisis, an economic, let's call it economic implosion, the, the fatal moment is when the dollar is no longer the reserve currency.